hello, NEPHEW community. My name is Dr. Jamini Patel. I'm a clinical and scientific liaison with Otsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization, Inc. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Edgar Lerma, who will be discussing IgA nephropathy, and we're very excited to have him here with us today. Dr. Lerma earned his Doctor of Medicine from the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Medicine and Surgery in Manila, Philippines, and completed residency training in internal medicine at the University of Illinois, Chicago, Mercy Hospital and Medical Center. He completed a fellowship in nephrology and hypertension at Northwest Memorial Hospital, the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University, and the Veterans Administration Lakeside Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Lerma is a diplomat in the subspecialty of nephrology with the American Board of Internal Medicine and has authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and presentations. In recognition of his clinical work and expertise, Dr. Lerma has been elected to fellowship of the American Society of Nephrology and National Kidney Foundation, as well as various other nephrology and cardiovascular associations. In recognition of his teaching, Dr. Lerma received the Subspecialty Teaching Attending Physician of the Year Award and Physician Recognition Award for Excellence in Academics in 2006 and 2011, respectively, from UIC Advocate Christ Medical Center. At present, he holds the rank of Clinical Professor of Medicine within the Section of Nephrology at the University of Illinois at Chicago and serves as the Educational Coordinator for Nephrology with UIC Advocate Christ Medical Center. Dr. Lerma's research interests include CKD, hypertension, bone and mineral disorders, and dyslipidemias in CKD. Thank you so much, Dr. Lerma, for being here today. We really appreciate your time. And let's get straight into this conversation about IgA nephropathy. Um, IgA nephropathy is, is definitely a very rare kidney disease that requires increased awareness. What can you tell us about the pathophysiology about this disease? Well, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction, first and foremost, Jaimini. So IgA nephropathy is actually considered as the most common glomerular disease worldwide. From the histopathological standpoint, it is characterized by a mesangial proliferative glomerular nephritis with diffuse mesangial deposition of IgA. In fact, it was first recognized in the 1960s, around 1968, by Jean Berger when immunofluorescent techniques were introduced for the study of kidney biopsy specimens. It is unique among glomerular diseases in being defined by the presence of an immune reactant rather than by any other morphologic feature on renal biopsy, and the light microscopy changes are actually variable. Now, when we talk about pathophysiology of the IgA nephropathy, we always have to look back at the four hit hypothesis. The four hit hypothesis is underlies the main explanation as to how IgA nephropathy um, evolves, or so we understand. So hit number one is the presence of increased blood levels of galactose deficient IgA one. And then hit number two is when the autoantibodies, IgG or IgA, specific for galactose-deficient IgA1 are formed. And then hit number three is when the immune complexes are formed between these pathogenic entities. And of course, hit number four refers to the accumulation of immune complexes in the glomeruli, which induces renal injury. So when this injury happens, it leads to mesangial cell damage and activation of secondary pathways and also leads to glomerular sclerosis and tubulo interstitial fibrosis. Thank you so much, Dr. Lerma, for going through that complex pathophysiology. I know you mentioned the four hit hypothesis that leads to kidney injury. Can you go through some of the hallmark signs and symptoms in patients presenting with IgA nephropathy that would potentially lead to further workup? So the most common presentation of IgA nephropathy actually includes a constellation of symptoms. The first and most common one is that of the presence of microscopic hematuria and moderate proteinuria. Um, that's the first one. Some of these patients also can present with hypertension 
Uh, sometimes they can have loin pain, uh, as well as fatigue and edema. It is important that early identification and management of proteinuria is crucial and critical for the treatment selection and to lower the risk of progression to end-stage kidney disease. Thank you so much for going through those signs and symptoms. Can patients at various ages present with IgA nephropathy, or do you find that a particular age group is generally presenting with these symptoms? Well, I am an adult nephrologist, so most of the patients I see are adults. Uh, I believe in children. Um, I think the correlate is the presence of IgA vasculitis, which is probably uh, a similar entity, but a different discussion in a whole it, of itself. Certainly, certainly. Well, thank you so much for clarifying that. Once you have a suspicion, you know, for IgA nephropathy, patients are presenting with these symptoms, what would be the steps then to diagnose IgA nephropathy? So if I'm going to draw back to the uh, recently published KDO guidelines, which was in 2021, we have to rem remember that IgA nephropathy can only be diagnosed with a kidney biopsy. There are no validated diagnostic serum or urine biomarkers for IgA nephropathy. And it is important that once uh, the diagnosis is established by a biopsy, we have to rule out the presence of other secondary causes. By secondary causes, this, this include number one, IgA vasculitis, Number two, this could be IgA nephropathy, secondary to, say, viral infections like HIV or hepatitis. Uh, it could be secondary to inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune disease, or even liver cirrhosis. And then, of course, another secondary cause that's important is that of IgA-dominant infection-related glomerulonephritis. And then once you are able to rule out those secondary causes, the next step is looking at the histopathology. Um, the recommendation is to score the biopsy using the MEST C-score. And then from there, uh, we need to re-stratify the patient using clinical and the histopathologic data. We can quantify the progression risk of diagnosis using the international IgA nephropathy prediction tool to inform discussions with patients for shared decision-making. Some of the patients may even have to be enrolled in a disease registry. And of course, it is important to emphasize that, you know, once all of these steps have been undertaken, we have to start uh, optimize supportive care. And by that, we include number one, blood pressure management. Number two, the use of maximum tolerated RAS inhibitors, that is ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. Number three, lifestyle modification. And number four, we always have to address cardiovascular risks. You mentioned some of the lifestyle modifications. What, what kind of modifications can patients make that may slow the progression of their disease or mitigate some symptoms? There's really nothing specific as far as lifestyle modifications. These are the lifestyle modifications that we recommend for everybody, even with hypertension or chronic kidney disease, weight loss if they are overweight, uh, dietary sodium restriction. Uh, those are, and also, you know, like aerobic exercise, 30 minutes a day, every other day, so on and so forth. Excellent. So definitely some of the lifestyle modifications that we would recommend across the board to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Thank you so much for, for clarifying that. And earlier you mentioned the MEST C score. Would you mind briefly discussing what that entails and how you would utilize that score to risk stratify patients? So the MEST C score is something that was a uh, um, created by the um, Oxford classification of IgA in a property. And, you know, basically this is something that is utilized uh, by um, nephrologists primarily for uh, sort of, um, you know, mapping out what are the prognosticators in patients. Uh, it is by no means uh, recommended to use to guide treatment. So the mess score is uh, the M stands for mesangial hypercellularity. 
E for endocapillary hypercellularity, S for segmental glomerulosclerosis, T for tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis, and then C, which was recently added, cellular or fibrocellular presence. Excellent. Thank you so much for going into a little bit more detail about that. This really concludes our discussion on IgA nephropathy today. Dr. Lerma, thank you so much for your expertise and your insight on this disease state. We really appreciate your time. And thank you so much for our nephew community for listening in. We really appreciate it. And for further information on upcoming events, please visit nephew.org. Thank you very much. Thank you.